Well, we're in the midst of a series on what it means to be a partaker of the divine nature. And in this video, we're progressing to the first S in theosis, which represents the seven ecumenical councils, all of which in various degrees impact the matter of deification or theosis. And by the way, it would be so wonderful if everyone watching this video would take the time to embed rudimentary details of each of the seven councils on the canvas of your consciousness. Another way of saying that is memorize them. Because these are epic moments in church history, moments that we all should be familiar with. Each of the seven not only serve to codify Trinitarian and Christological truths, but they underscore deification or theosis as the universal end of saved humanity. Let's go through them. In the first ecumenical council, this is the Council of Nicaea in 325, the church affirmed against an Alexandrian priest named Arius the dogma of the consubstantial trinity. Why? Because it is the word, the logos, who opens the way to union with the Godhead. And if the incarnate word was not the same substance with the Father, if he be not truly God, well, then our deification is impossible. So that was the first ecumenical council. The second ecumenical council is the Council of Constantinople. This is the council that took place in 381. And in it, the church affirmed against Macedonius, he was an Arian bishop of Constantinople, the equality and the single essence of God the Holy Spirit with God the Father and God the Son. Why? Because if the Holy Spirit, as Macedonius contended, is a created power and therefore subservient to God the Father and God the Son, our deification is rendered moot. Because the doer in deification is the Holy Spirit with whom deified humanity joins its will so as to experience union with God. It's also perhaps worth noting that in addition to its significance respecting deification, the Council of Constantinople supplemented Nicaea with five articles in which are set forth the theology concerning the Holy Spirit, the Church, the mysteries, the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the age to come. And as such, the first two ecumenical councils formulated the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, which serves as a template to the church for, as has been well said, for, for what has been believed everywhere, always and by all. And that takes us to the third ecumenical council. That's the Council of Ephesus in 431. In this council, the church affirmed against another heretic, Nestorius, he was the Archbishop of Constantinople, no insignificant person, that the Virgin Mary is and forever will be Theotokos, bearer of God, as opposed to the heretical notion that she was merely Christotokos, bearer of Christ, just a man in whom God dwelled as if in a temple. Without equivocation, the council affirmed the apostolic truth that Jesus is true God and true man, and that therefore the Virgin Mary, she's truly Theotokos, the mother of God according to his human nature. Why? Again, because if Christ were not truly the God-man, we could not become gods by grace, gods in life and nature, but not in the Godhead. The Fourth Ecumenical Council, that was the Council of Chalcedon, 451. In the Council of Chalcedon, 
the church affirmed against Eutyches, who was the abbot of a monastery outside of Constantinople, that Christ is one person with two natures. And this was in opposition to the notion that the human nature of Christ was swallowed up by the divine nature, kind of like a drop of wine in the sea. As such, the church rose up against the monophysites, that means one nature, people that believed in the one nature, to show that since the fullness of true human nature had been assumed by the word, it is our whole humanity that must enter into union with God. The fifth ecumenical council, well, this was the council of Constantinople II, and it took place in 553. And in it, the church reaffirmed against two heretics that Christ is forever one person with two natures. For if in incarnation Christ did not take on our humanity, we could not attain to the great and glorious promise of participating in the divine nature. And another point, in concert with the first four council, the Council of Constantinople II ratified the Trinitarian and Christological creeds that are regarded as normative by the major Christian confessions, and not only of the East, but the West as well. That takes us to the Sixth Ecumenical Council. This is the Council of Constantinople III. It takes place in 680, and in it, the Church affirmed against Sergius. He was the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. A lot of these patriarchs were of Constantinople. But they held that, that, that Christ has two wills, the human will freely subject to the divine will. And by doing that, the church resisted the monothelites, the people that believed in only one will. And there's a reason for this, because apart from the union of the two wills, the divine and the human will, there could be no attaining to deification or union with God. Now the last of the Seventh Ecumenical Councils takes place in Nicaea. It's called the Council of Nicaea II, and it takes place in 787. And in it, the church affirmed against the iconoclasts, that means the icon smashers, that far from violating the second commandment, icons are actually the expression through a material medium of divine realities. The Second Council of Nicaea afforded icons their rightful place as well windows into another world, an iconographic world of those deified by graces dispensed within the spiritual gymnasium, which is the body of Christ. The fathers of the seven ecumenical councils never lost sight of our union with God. Under the guidance of the precious Spirit of God, they testified to the transcendence of Trinitarian and Christological truths their authority grounded, not in their own opinions, but grounded in the church of the living God, which is, as Paul puts it, the pillar and the foundation of truth. Now, to memorize the seven ecumenical councils and digest this brief overview, get a copy of my book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More, and enjoy. And remember, this is not as hard to memorize as you might think. Uh, the reason being is you got three councils in Constantinople. You have two in Nicaea, the first and the last. And then you have the Council of Ephesus and the Council of Chalcedon. So it's not difficult. You just got to spend a little time with it. And again, I give more detail and really a way of remembering it in my book, Truth Matters life matters more. Well, in the next video, uh, we move to the I in theosis, which will serve to remind you of incarnation.
And as I'm going to point out, the more you contemplate the mystery of God becoming man, the more staggered will be your imagination. But again, I'll reserve that for the next video.